This episode is brought to you by Speroni. Revolutionize your shop floor with Speroni, where cutting edge technology meets craftsmanship. Elevate precision, amplify productivity. Speroni, experience, tradition, the future. Hello, and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, and we're here to ignite your passion for a culture of creativity, engagement, and productivity in the manufacturing sector. Before we get into today's exciting episode, remember to swing by our website, manufacturingculturepodcast.com, to catch up on past episodes and other resources we have on the website. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd love to see you there. Now, folks, fasten your seatbelts because today we have someone who is the epitome of a multifaceted dynamo, someone who is transforming the way startups with physical products evolve from prototypes to game-changing commercial success. Let's give a warm welcome to Laura Teicher, the Executive Director of Forge. Laura wears many hats and wears them well. From taking charge of Forge's health and sustainability to overseeing all things operational, financial, and program management, she's a one-woman powerhouse steering this incredible organization forward. You know, it's often said that great leaders excel in either the analytical or the creative side, but Laura, she's a rare breed. She dances on the tightrope between analytical thinking and creative strategy. Hold on to your hard hats because we're diving into a discussion that could only be termed as a perfect blend of innovation, operations, and transformational change. And let me spill a little extra tea about her background, folks. Laura isn't just a business whiz. She has degrees in studio art and English as well, plus an MBA focused on building cross-cultural teams and creating shared value. Now, how's that for a Renaissance woman? But wait, there's more. Laura had a stint at the Massachusetts State Senate for three years, followed by three years scaling operations in wealth management. Talk about a background rich in diversity and breadth. This woman is fueled by her commitment to make an impact, and it shows in every single role she's taken, from the Boston professional chapter of Net Impact to her current spot on the board of directors of Climate Exchange. So get ready to have your minds blown as we talk about how to revolutionize your startup from prototype to scale, the importance of cross-cultural teams in the manufacturing industry, and how to balance creativity and analytics in your leadership style. Stay tuned. This isn't this is an episode you won't want to miss. And who knows, by the end of this podcast, you might just find yourself inspired to be the next change maker in your organization. Hello, Laura. Welcome to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you so much for having me, Jim, and for the very warm intro. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I I appreciate you taking your time today. Um, And as for the intro, uh, that is my favorite part of hosting this podcast is is putting those intros together. I love it. I, I think I need to go on the road and just start hyping people up as, as part of my business. I think you could. <laughs> that that would be fun, but then it would take me away from my family. Uh, I started my company to not travel so much, um, so I, I have to figure out how to balance that. Uh, Laura, thanks again for being on. Uh, really excited about our conversation. You are... Uh, quite the human being as far as your career is concerned. Uh, I couldn't fit it in the two minute intro there. Uh, So before we talk uh, too much about Forge and we will get there, um, can you give me kind of your, your journey and where, where have you been? I mean, the state Senate in Massachusetts, wealth management, uh, nonprofits, uh, take us on that, that journey with you. Well, as you've outlined, it it hasn't been a straight path. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Really, I think at the end of the day, for me, it's been a journey about figuring out where I can be most impactful and effective and looking to engage on the policy side to influence change there. 
looking to get my business degree and work in the private sector to demonstrate that I did have those chops. And then ultimately, thankfully, uh, landing in mission-focused leadership roles, which has been just a perfect fit for me. But I wouldn't be as effective in these roles today if I hadn't had that meandering path. Sure. And what I will say is one challenge there is in the earlier stages of a meandering path, it can be a challenge. And I'm sure there are listeners who are out there who are finding their way and it can be hard to articulate. But once you get to the place that really fits for you, I have found that that diverse background has really been an asset in my current role. I, I can only imagine. I mean, uh, it, it you bring a unique perspective that you've gained to your, you're collecting uh, perspectives, if you will, like walking along the beach in, in Massachusetts there, you're collecting seashells, uh, your career path. You've just been collecting perspectives that, that help shape the way you lead today. Right. I love that framing. Although the beach closest to me, I'd be collecting rocks, not seashells. <laughs> See, that's that's I I know West Coast Beach is a lot more than I know East Coast Beach is, but uh, I digress. Uh, thank you. Uh, but yes, you, you're you're just collecting those perspectives along the way, right? Absolutely. And I would say, you know, I know we'll dive into my current role more, but one of the things about leading a nonprofit is that you're engaging with multiple different communities, the communities you serve the communities that help you serve those communities, the communities that fund that work. So having a diverse perspective can help you navigate and translate between all of the players that you have to bring to the table to maximize that impact. Sure. I get that completely. So tell us more about Forge. What What is Forge? What, do you, what does Forge do? How many people work there? <coughs> How many companies do you serve? Pardon me. Uh, I'll, I'll give us all the, the information that we need to know about Forge. Gladly. I love talking about Forge. <laughs> so first off, let's get this out of the way. Um, Forge itself does not manufacture products, which I think might be a little bit unusual on this podcast. But what we do do is help emerging hard tech companies with their pathway through production and to scale very focused on the product development, manufacturing, and supply chains of these companies. And what we also do is help establish contract manufacturers and suppliers in our operating regions connect with those ready and right fit innovative products to make. So we're in the middle of manufacturing on both sides, adding value to the ecosystem, but we do not make anything physical ourselves. Got it. Got it. Thanks for the clarification there. Uh, because with a name like Forge, people probably call you and say, hey, can you make me a casting? Well, and the answer there is no, but we know someone who can. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Tell us more about Forge. So Forge is a nonprofit. We are mission focused. And our primary mission is to help the innovative and emerging companies get those products to market through the focus on the physical build. And one thing that we're really proud of at Forge is the sheer reach of the impact of this work because it is a unique focus. Mm -hmm. And I think your listeners are probably very well versed on the manufacturing side but they may not know that in the area that Forge operates, New England, there are many, many hundreds of innovation support organizations, but most of them are really focused on business planning, fundraising, uh, physical space, all these other aspects of support that a rising company needs. And Forge works with all of those incubators and accelerators and sort of serves as the centralized support for the physical build which is so important when you're talking about solving some of the world's toughest problems, climate tech, medical device, robotics. None of these solutions can come to market and come to impact without that physical build. And so we've done this over 700 startups and emerging companies. We've supported really high survival rates. 
And we've helped them accelerate their physical build and their production and do it locally. 700. I mean, that's, that's, uh, I'm still focused on that number. 700 startups have, have utilized your facilitation uh, uh, services. That's correct. And to dig a little deeper on what that really looks like, I like to talk about the pillars of Forge being education. So helping these founders actually prepare to scale up their manufacturing. Many are coming from deeply technical backgrounds, but not from the established manufacturing industry or not from the experience of scaling a product and everything that that entails. So there's this education piece. And then there's this connection piece where Forge itself builds and maintains relationships with hundreds of regional suppliers that actually want to work with new and innovative products. So we help curate connections between these two folks to help really progress production faster. And then finally, we do do some funding to help address um, discrete gaps in product development. So oftentimes these scaling hard tech companies, uh, for example, have reached a beta prototype phase. Mm -hmm. And before they can get their next pilot or their next funding round or their next piece of traction, they just need to solve one piece of their product development. And Forge will come in and inject support there as well. And it's all in service of accelerating their build stage and just getting these solutions to market with a higher success rate and faster to impact. That's absolutely amazing. So uh, you've said a couple of times in New England, uh, do you expand your reach beyond the New England region or, or are you primarily focused in, in the Northeast there? It depends. Okay, yeah, fair. <laughs> so um, we operate physically in Massachusetts and Connecticut today. Okay. And what that means is that the connection side of our offering is somewhat regionally bound to New England. However, because we're offering really unique and important support for innovators, we're, we're actually supporting startups and scaling companies uh, from across the country and even around the world now because they're finding us because they need this help. They're finding us because they're hearing about us from their peers, they're finding us through organic search, they're finding us as we get more visible, as we keep growing. And so there's an aspect of our footprint where our people are, where our relationships are that are currently today very New England based, and yet our reach impact is somewhat global at this point. I, I, that's amazing. Um, and hopefully after today or after this episode airs, drops, whatever you want to say, release, uh, people will hear more about Forge from this podcast, right? I, I, I hope that even, you know, a couple people take away, oh my gosh, this is a really neat organization I didn't know about. And and they reach out to you and and connect with you on, on a different level. Um, so how do you determine which startups are right for Forge? Or do you just take all comers with that hard tech? <laughs> you know, that that is something that has evolved in my time at Forge and will evolve again. Yeah. Uh, so we currently focus on helping any company that has a new physical product or a new manufacturing or supply chain need in bringing their products to market. So we're sector agnostic. Okay. You heard me talk a little bit earlier about climate tech, med device, robotics. We also touch... Um, you know, green chemistry, advanced materials, consumer products. So hmm. really deep tech stuff like nuclear fusion and then uh, very accessible things like plastic Frisbees. If it needs to be made, we're here to help. Now, the caveat to that is because we're really focused on scaling manufacturing strategies and supply chains, we do not engage before there's a physical prototype. And some of our services are only accessible when a little more uh, traction and development than that has been achieved, purely in service of making sure that we are really impactful in our engagements. Sure. That makes total sense. So, uh, you know, if I were to invent a, a better shovel handle 
for example, that was more ergonomic, uh, mm -hmm. provided safer uh, abilities for shovel users out there. And I had, you know, cobbled something together in my garage. I could then call Forge and say, hey, Forge, uh, I've got this prototype. Here's what it does. Here's the, the issues that it solves. And you help me connect uh, to manufacturers that can help build and scale that product? Potentially. Okay. So what we do is we ask a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and we're really trying to understand where you are in your physical build, where you are in your readiness to engage with contract manufacturers and suppliers. And it's not unusual, for example, for a company to think they're ready to go to an injection molder, but we identify that they need a little help getting ready before they do. Got it. And so for the manufacturers listening who might be excited about engaging with new and innovative products through Forge as a contract manufacturer or supplier, know that we won't send companies to that production phase if we identify they need more help getting their bill of materials or their specs or their funding or anything else in order first. And so that's really where that education piece comes in. Yeah. Um, that being said, we will help. How we help will depend on where the company really is in their readiness and in their scale. Wow. I, that's a, just such a, a fascinating mission. So how do then companies, contract manufacturers, right? The, the bulk of, I think, who's probably listening today. Uh, how do those people uh, become part of this ecosystem uh, for Forge? So just like on the innovation side, we would look to connect one-to-one -one and do some data collection to really understand the capabilities, the volumes, the budgetary requirements, the superpowers of the contract manufacturer or supplier. So anything around the physical build. Yeah. Uh, that can include packaging and logistics and contract engineering and some things people may not immediately think of when you say manufacturing. Mm -hmm. We take care on both sides to truly understand the needs and the capabilities and on board formally any company we engage with. And then, you know, should someone come into our supplier network, once we have all that information, they start getting what we see as right fit referrals for potential forward looking business. Wow. And, and are there ever situations where somebody comes to you with a product that is so unique that your current supplier base or your current network or ecosystem can't fit or or fill the needs of that that physical product? And so then you have to go out and, and search and, and do uh, some some finding of of contract manufacturers or, or anybody within that uh, up or downstream supply chain needs. Absolutely. We're serving roughly 300 or more innovative companies a year now. Oh my and gosh. And it's sector agnostic. And so I think this is a good application of the 80-20 rule. About 80% of the needs, very, very easy, already in network, already vetted, already have feedback from past innovators. So we really know um, that they'll do right by those companies. And then there are Often these cases where something really unique comes up, uh, some examples I can think of are a very fine degree of zinc wire that we've never been asked for before that most suppliers of zinc wire don't provide. Mm -hmm. Laser cutting, but of a really unique material. Uh, and there are certainly more advanced examples, but the team luckily has dedicated people and wraparound experts to help with scouting new needs as they come. And then importantly, we're very honest with the emerging tech companies. So if someone comes to us and asks us for a thing we don't have a network, we tell them we don't have it yet and we tell them we will look for it. Wow, that's really neat. Um, are you able to share any success stories uh, where you have a startup and a manufacturer that have formed those relationships? I mean, is that something you can, you can share those stories? 
Absolutely. So we don't share stories without permission, but we have a whole library of stories <laughs> we have permission to share. Wonderful. Um, so one I think that would be exciting for you know this audience because it, it's sort of a two-way street in terms of benefits is our work with United Aircraft Technologies. So they make a device that holds electrical wiring in place and monitors the health of the whole electrical system. Wow. So this was founded with aircraft in mind, but is actually currently being piloted in ground vehicles, has potential use cases in the electrical grid. And the the story of how this innovation came about is interesting. And then the story of the ways that Forge has helped is interesting. So one of the founders of UAT spent 14 years, I think, in the Army okay. and trained as an aircraft electrician. He ultimately developed severe carpal tunnel syndrome. Mm. And that inspired him to design his first innovation, which was a smart, easy-to-install wiring clamp. So, you know, I learn new things at Forge every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things I've learned from this company is that aircraft electricians have historically diagnosed wiring issues visually and manually. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how that's challenging if you have carpal tunnel syndrome. Absolutely. So... This ultimately evolved into UAT's product today, which is a first-of-kind product that can diagnose electrical faults wirelessly and continuously. Wow. So they integrated that smart clamp with software platform, and electricians can use that to assess wiring without even having to touch it or even be in the same building. That's amazing. Yes. And you can imagine all of the components and all of the manufacturing that go into not only a, a smart clamp that works, but connecting it up so that this software can pull that information. This is a great example of the space that Forge often plays in, even though we emphasize our focus on physical products and physical build. Many of the, those products do have to integrate with software. Um, so very early on, Forge's manufacturing expert and resident, Scott Longley, connected UAT to Cinecon Plastics, which is a custom injection molder in Western Massachusetts. And on a personal note, they're based in Dalton, Massachusetts, where I once lived. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that company made a mold for the brackets, for the smart clamp. But one thing I love about this story is that Cinecon even uses UAT's smart clamp in its own facilities wiring. So they're using that smart tech to help inform their own facilities usage, but also to help UAT test the technology's sensing abilities. And another cool thing about the smart clamp that ties into Cinecon Plastics is it is made predominantly out of plastic, which is not the case with the types of products that used to be accessible. And weight is really, really important when you're talking about aircraft and defense. So their product is not only smart and enabling greater accessibility for electricians, but it also is ultimately more aerodynamic for the aircrafts it's deployed in. And Forge has played a part not only in helping with its supply chain and manufacturing, but also in uh, their experience of coming through the Western Massachusetts Founders Network, which is a collaborative effort between Forge and the Western Mass Economic Development Council and Mass Tech Collaborative and a few other players. So there are all these different touch points, UATC, Sorry, UAT. <laughs> we're really proud, despite my flub that I just had, <laughs> uh, of kind of this really transformational product that they're bringing to market that has limitless applications in the future. That's amazing. I, I, I find the way that innovation comes to market absolutely fascinating. Um, the because it's always very personal to to some person right the the person who invents it saw this need and in this case it was it was because of carpal tunnel right and and it was based on his need but 
that's revolutionary for the for the industry as a whole. Absolutely. And another thing this story underscores that I like to emphasize, um, you know, the founders of this company have deep technical chops and deep domain knowledge, but it truly takes a village to bring a new product to market. I've had some of our companies give me a supply chain analysis showing that it took them over a hundred different suppliers and contractors to make the thing. Wow. And so no matter how much deep technical expertise a founder has, they can't know all of those dimensions within their own head. And I think that's part of where Forge really serves as this outsourced free and mission aligned support to pull in all those extra pieces of technical expertise and technical de-risking. Wow. Laura, talk to us a little bit about uh, in researching the, you know, the episode and, and Forge itself. Uh, I read something about Greentown Labs and and how you uh, at Forge work with not only incubators but also universities. Talk to us about that dynamic and and what value uh, the university ecosystem brings to this, and and then also what is Greentown Labs. Well, first off, shout out to Greentown Labs. Woohoo! <laughs> Greentown Labs is Forge's sister organization. And we essentially were initially built within Greentown Labs and then spun out. But more okay. important, Greentown Labs is the largest climate tech incubator in North America. Got it. Got and it. so what does they, that mean for, for people like me who don't necessarily understand what that means? Absolutely. Uh, they help bring climate mitigation and climate solution technologies um, through that innovation arc. Wow. Much like Forge does, but with a focus on incubation and community and the services that Greentown provides. And our roots are really deeply tied to Greentown because it was the former CEO of Greentown that recognized when you're solving a, a physical problem in the world, be it rising sea levels or optimizing the electrical grid, there is more often than not at least a hardware component to engaging with the physical world. Brilliant. And there's not enough support for the building of the hardware. And that is where the core of Forge was born. And then we, we quickly spun out and realized that we could bring more manufacturing capabilities and expertise in the market, um, sorry, into our network. And we could also have greater impact if we expanded our services beyond just climate tech. But climate tech is still about 40% of the companies that we serve today, again, because it's so grounded in hardware. Yeah. And so we, we love our sister organization, Green Town Labs, and we, we wouldn't be here today without them. That's wonderful. And and so how do you leverage the university system out there? Oh, that's right. Thank you. So for Forge to be effective, we need critical clusters of research and development and critical clusters of manufacturing capabilities. And the universities are such a force in creating new and innovative IP. And that's where a lot of these new hard tech creations start. And then they often come into the ecosystem, get support with business planning, eventually create their looks like or works like prototype, and then find their way to forage if they're in hard tech so we can help them scale that physical build. Wow. That's really neat. Um, you, We talked a little bit about your background and, and its diversity. Um, how did you go from business uh, to art back to business? Talk us through uh, your pathway into now Forge uh, a little bit more, just because it, it is so diverse. And, and you brought up something earlier, uh, mission-focused leadership. So how has uh, uh, that collection of perspectives led you to this place of, of mission-focused leadership? Well, I don't want to bore our listeners, <laughs> but uh, I'll acknowledge when I was in undergrad, I was just doing what I loved at the moment, which was 
painting and drawing and reading English literature. And then I stumbled out into the real world and I was trying to figure out what I could do that would be meaningful with my career. And I, I luckily quickly landed in the state Senate and worked for two different really thoughtful and impact oriented legislators. Uh, so I was able to have an impact there. Ultimately, my boss retired. Uh, I assessed my options and I found that I was already hitting a little bit of a ceiling in my career mm -hmm. in part because of that art and English background. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was second choice for a, a couple of career opportunities that were really exciting to me and we get the feedback. Well, we don't know if you know how to manage a budget. <laughs> and so I set about to correct for what my background looked like. And I went to business school and then I went into the private sector and worked in wealth management to show that I really was committed and to, to learn the technical aspects and the hard aspects that I would need to achieve higher leadership and to get into more impactful roles. Got it. And then through a combination of all of that experience and some really intentional volunteerism, I ultimately landed my first role leading a mission-focused organization, and the rest is history. But what I will say is, that, again, that diverse background was challenging when I was finding my way. Sure. Uh, when I was younger. And now it truly is an asset. You know, for example, one of the, the biggest complaints, at least when I graduated from business school, about stu uh, MBA students, and I know people have a lot to say about MBA students, <laughs> Uh, but one of the biggest negative feedback points was uh, written and verbal communication, right. you know, an over focus on the financials and the economics and the hard stuff. And, you know, that's where my English degree started to become an asset. So all Good. these things ultimately knitted together. And as I think I mentioned earlier, I think one of the core things that Forge needs to do to be effective in the position that we're in in the ecosystem is translate between all these different players. You might think a technical founder and a manufacturer are speaking the same language, but they often aren't. They often have different technical training yeah. and different focus areas. And then, hey, we have to get that all funded by someone at Forge. <laughs> and so we have to talk a different language with our funders. Right. And I think having that more generalist and diverse background has ultimately come an asset for me in this role. Uh, so how, how many people work for you at Forge? Uh, are you truly a one person band or, or do you have a, a team that, that helps you in this mission? I'm absolutely not a one person band. <laughs> um, the team really is who is executing and, None of this would be possible without the awesome team that I get to work with every day. We have a mixture of full-time and really key contracted roles. Mm -hmm. We're about 12 full-time team members today. We've been growing pretty aggressively over the last few years, and we're hiring today too, so shameless plug for our listeners um, that we have some open roles at Forge right now. What are some of those open roles? I, I love plugging on the show, uh, people who are looking and, you know, uh, typically it's machine operators, right? Because that's our typical guest, but mm -hmm. a, a lot of people who do listen to this might not be the, the technical side, right? And they may be interested in this industry, um, but don't want to run a machine or, or aren't capable of running a machine. So what kind of roles do you have open right now? We have two roles that are formally open. They're both in our newer Connecticut location. And one of them is really focused on engaging the regional supply chain and ecosystem. And the other actually gets to focus predominantly on interacting directly with the startups and assessing their needs. And so a technical background is actually valuable in both. Okay. Um, because we're dealing with technical people on both yeah. sides. And it, it goes a long way to building those relationships and trust to have that technical background. That being said, clearly, you've heard about my background. You do not need to have a, a technical background to be effective <laughs> forge. You need to be intellectually curious and eager to learn and eager to help and um, very mission and service oriented 
And then you can actually train up on some of these roles. But it doesn't it doesn't hurt if you've worked in manufacturing or have an engineering degree in some of these roles. Sure. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so where where for Forge specifically, and we're a little late into the episode to be getting into this question, but where was the culture when when you started with Forge uh, as far as the alignment of values and, and all of those things uh, versus where it is now and, and where do you want to get it to? That's a great question. And we were a lot smaller when I came in. So okay. there were three of us. Okay. So you've scaled had, internally. Yes. And we hadn't codified our values or um, really done the strategy planning that we're now leveraging. That doesn't mean strategy planning hadn't been done and that sure. the, the people involved weren't incredibly thoughtful. But we we were operating under a different name and we were serving about 40 companies a year. And I'm really lucky I even found out about the role. <laughs> I found out about it through networking. It was sort of small and unknown, okay. but but impact, incredibly impactful. Mm -hmm. And so when I found out about it, I got more and more excited because it is a really unique focus and a unique position in the innovation support ecosystem. And after I joined, there was a tremendous amount of strategic planning and there was this broadening of scope across sectors and there's this broadening of regional um, reach. Mm -hmm. And there was this codifying of values and codifying of our North Star. And so we've gone through a lot of, um, you know, culture oriented and strategy oriented work since then. And our name is different. Our focus is different. Our team is different. So it's changed quite a bit. That's awesome. Where do you want to get it to? I, I mean, what's you, you talk about your North Star and, and, codifying you know your values and your mission and your vision where do you want to get uh forge to what's what's in, on the horizon we want to solidify the growth we've already experienced and so we're going through a process of reviewing because you always have to review and continuously improve right yeah uh, reviewing where we are today and assessing which of our programming is most effective for which sector and which life stage and sort of tightening everything up, ultimately in service of hopefully in the future, more expansion of geographic reach. Cool. Because we feel a little bit of um, a responsibility as we're getting more and more inbound interest for support to grow our ability and to grow our efficiency in deploying that support so we can bring more of these, you know, transformative solutions to market. So we want to do it thoughtfully and intentionally. Um, but the big picture vision is to grow, to be serving anywhere throughout the country that this support is needed. So anywhere where there are clusters of hard tech and there are clusters of manufacturing capability that are not being served and knitted together. It, it, it's an area we need to look at. Could we have more impact? Could we help there as well? Mm -hmm. I love it. And and so because you aim to charge that local economy, how, how do you measure or uh, quantify that impact uh, both for the startup community, uh, startups and for the community and the manufacturing ecosystem as a whole? We love data at Forge. <laughs> <laughs> so there are hundreds of que answers to that question. Okay. But, you know, our tippity top impact measures that we're focused on today are number one, progression across physical build for the new innovative products. So are they moving to the next phase and are we helping them move there faster? Mm -hmm. And then um, their feedback on the qualitative qualitative assessment of the value of all of the educational work we do. We have manufacturing readiness workshops and workbooks and meetups and 
ad hoc educational content based on trends we're seeing. And every time we ask the attendees, you know, did this help you progress your physical build? Did this help evolve your manufacturing strategies? We want to make sure that educational side is effective. Mm -hmm. And then finally, on the connection side, you know, a good signal that we're making the right fit connections that are moving the product along is did the innovative company and the supplier end up going into contract through our connection? So those are some of the top things we're looking at today. I love it. I love it. Uh, That's I mean, everybody loves to be measured, but the fact that you guys are measuring the impact is just really neat. I love that a lot. Um, What kind of advice do you have for, you know, Joe who works at a manufacturing facility um, and and has that idea? How, How does somebody take that idea that they have based on their personal experiences and and get to that next step. Um, you know, everybody talks about that quote unquote shark tank moment, right? Um, how, how do they get to that next step? I think the biggest thing for any of us who are trying to grow any type of company or organization is asking for help. Okay. I like it. No one can be an expert in everything. Mm -hmm. And we all have our blind spots about where we do and do not have expertise. So at the idea stage, my top recommendation is very early on testing the idea with the potential customers and and making sure you don't have a blind spot there. Yeah. Uh, But then looking for these support organizations uh, that do exist. And again, Forge doesn't really engage so much at the ideation stage, but there are hundreds and hundreds of mission-driven organizations that do, that can help you with your customer discovery, with your business planning, with your team building. Um, You know, at Forge, I'm working to grow this organization as well. And I I can't do it without the team, without the board of directors, without the advisors. So my number one recommendation is to not just go it alone in the early stages, but start bringing in help and expertise anywhere that you can. Sure. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. as you grow, uh, are there specific areas that that you're looking to expand into geographically, or or is it just going to be uh, dictated by uh, the market, for lack of a better term? Both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've done a lot of analysis of where these clusters of R&D and manufacturing capabilities are. And there are are different reasons to grow that we have to navigate, including where can we help bring the most innovative new products to market? Where can we bring in new clusters of manufacturing and supply chain capability? Um, And as you talk about the market, you know, a a thing with a mission-driven nonprofit is that a big part of our model does require mission-aligned funding. Yeah. So we do have to be paying attention to where there's enthusiasm and where there's support for our mission. And luckily, there's a lot of that across the country. That's awesome. Um, I, I, I like that. Um, Laura, what habit I asked you that you want to share with the, the guests? Do you have any knowledge bombs that you want to drop on anybody today? That's a, you're, you're giving me a lot of runway. <laughs> I am. Absolutely. This is, this is Laura's opportunity to, to go in whatever direction. And sometimes uh, it backfires and, and kicks me in the face, but I don't think that's going to happen here. So what do you got for us, Laura? <laughs> Well, one thing I was reflecting on coming into this podcast, which is focused on culture. So I was actually reflecting on a few things, but starting at the top, um, you know, as trends in in smart manufacturing and advanced manufacturing are happening and manufacturers are navigating challenges and upskilling existing workforce and attracting rising workforce and deploying new technologies Although Forge is not, again, a manufacturer ourselves, I think one 
role we can play and or at least emphasize to folks Mm -hmm. uh, in manufacturing is that working with these innovators that we can help connect isn't just exciting because it really is, (laughs) Um, but it, it also can be a way to attract rising talent and to, and we've heard this from our supplier network, really help them kind of shift their workforce demographics because the rising workforce wants to work on cool stuff like robots and um, shuttles to the moon <laughs> and uh, solving world hunger and pulling energy out of the air. And we're at the intersection of all this innovation. Uh, but it also can help the manufacturers themselves um, kind of emphasize the value of innovation internally. And I, I do think there's a little bias here because sometimes it's the most innovative manufacturers and suppliers that engage with Forge and want to deal with the new product. Yep. But I, I really do see them attracting young talent and um, embracing innovation and um, you know tapping into new opportunities in an exciting way. And I, I think threading the kind of existing established manufacturing and the rising manufacturing companies together helps power both sides, not just bringing the innovators to market. And and that is of cultural value. Well, Laura, you just uh, basically gave the outline of what will be episode two with you, um, because that's a super important topic. And you're right, we didn't even get to culture really uh, outside of uh, internally at Ford. So I, I'm. If you'd come back on, I'd love to have you on uh, for a second episode, and we dive into that aspect of manufacturing. I, I would. It would be a pleasure and a privilege, Jim. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. I, I love that. That I, I'm ready to go already. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So, anything else that that you want to uh, share with us today? I guess one other cultural nugget, because this is what I was noodling on coming into this session. Um, I think one of the fundamentals that I learned from working with innovators and startups and helping them scale is this concept that what gets a founder or a leader from point A to point B might get them from B to C, but it probably won't get them from C to Z. Mm. And there's this human nature thing where I, I face it myself. We get stuck in saying, well, I've been doing this and I've been succeeding, so I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. And we try to coach our startups around that, making sure they don't get stuck in, for example, hand building all of their prototypes once they scale first past a certain level because that, that'll put you out of business financially. Um, and I have to think about this as I lead Forge and as we grow. But I I also think this comes back to um, the manufacturers who are engaging with the innovative new products. Sometimes you see, um, you know, a a fear or a concern that we're just talking about someone tinkering in their garage and it's going to be expensive and hard to work with them. But in in reality, uh, a lot of these contract manufacturers have had the same steady clients for many, many years And that won't always hold true. And so thinking towards the future and thinking towards what's the next big product that we're well positioned to help bring to market Mm -hmm. can be part of what can bring us all, you know, from C to Z. And I'm just always trying to think about, okay, how do I need to evolve because I've learned from our startups? And then I also hope that our startups and our manufacturers are always thinking about how do I need to evolve to hit the next level? I love it. I love it. Well, folks, what an incredible journey. A huge thank you to Laura Teicher, um, the brilliant mind that's steering Forge into becoming a catalyst for innovation, connection, and growth. If your gears weren't already turning, they definitely should be now. From dissecting what makes a startup the right fit for Forge to diving into the impacts of the organization Forge itself, We've covered ground that's been absolutely revolutionary, and we didn't even really talk about culture. (laughs) And let's not forget these golden nuggets that Laura dropped here at the end about the power of attracting rising talent, 
human nature in general and, and the power of change, which we definitely will discuss in a second episode. So Laura, thank you very much for being on. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's been it a was pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Folks, if you're excited about transforming your business or if you're a startup looking to break into the physical product sector, this episode is the start of your playbook. A huge thank you again to Laura for sharing her wisdom, stories, and quite frankly, actionable advice with us today. Uh, don't go yet. Don't turn us off yet. If you're loving what you're hearing on this podcast, make sure to visit our website, manufacturingculturepodcast.com. Catch up on all of our previous episodes and grab some awesome resources, uh, some swag, all the fun stuff that we've got up there. Uh, please keep the love and insights flowing by sharing this episode with your friends, your grandma, your boss. And don't forget to rate and review the show to help us reach even more change makers just like you. So until next time, folks, have a great day and keep making things. <laughs>